Welcome again. Today we're doing Mark chapter 3. Now in this chapter we talk about Jesus healing on the Sabbath again. We talk about how crowds followed him. We talk about Jesus appointing the 12. We talk about how uh, Jesus got accused again as well. And we also talk again about his family and also uh, some run-ins he has by the, uh, the teachers of the law. So let's get right into this. This is uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 1. He, speaking of Jesus, entered again into the synagogue. Okay? And, you know, I, I, I got to stop here because um, I got to say this. Because it's just, you know, so many people, it's so easy for people to subconsciously connect one thing with another, you know, like saying church, God, church, Jesus. Or when you, when you say Jesus, people think about church. When you, when you say God, people think about church or vice versa. Jesus could have, you know, it could have said right after his baptism, uh, you know, it comes out of the water. It says, you know, the father says, this is my beloved son. He could have said right there and then, okay, guys, I'm going to call you, know, you, 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 come follow me. You're going to be the elders of my church. We're going to build the church. And, we're, and here's, your, here's your plan of, of planting churches, okay? Here we go. We're going to go into a cell structure. You know, I mean, he could have did all kinds of stuff like this, but he didn't. Okay, Jesus and his church, his people, attended synagogue. Okay, so... Uh, you know, I like to say this. Let me say this again. Biblically speaking, the church went to synagogue. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Very important. You know, we should, if you're going anywhere, why don't you go preach at a synagogue? You want to go preach, you know, Yeshua or the gospel, good news. Uh, I know you're thinking, oh, how far am I going to get with that? But hey, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, but... Hey, he entered into the synagogue. He didn't go and build, a, build himself a church or whatever. He always went to synagogue. It says in the, in the scriptures it was his custom to attend synagogue. And we see this throughout the New Testament. And there was a man there who had his hand withered. He was disabled. They watched him, whether he would heal on the sab heal him on the Sabbath day. Now, <laughs> you, you got to kind of chuckle a little bit after reading this because you think, you know, how, how stupid, how blind these people are. And yet, how knowledgeable they are. They're, okay, we know, that we know that Jesus heals people. On, and, you know, obviously, they didn't accuse him of faking miracles. It wasn't fake miracles. It was real miracles. Um. So, apparently, they trusted Jesus in a, in a way to heal them. And like, oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's somebody here that needs healing. There's someone here that's disabled. Here comes Jesus. I'm going to watch to see what happens because we expect him to heal. Okay? Isn't that interesting? And this is like his, his enemies, you know, his accusers. Because it says here in the last half of uh, verse 2, um, Okay, they watched him whether they would heal whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. These are the accusers of Jesus. So you think the accusers of Jesus, the enemies of Jesus, knew Jesus well enough to know. Okay, you know what? Ever anybody that's crippled, and Jesus is there in the midst. Let's watch. <laughs> it's it's going to happen. You know. <laughs> I don't know how they can do this without, without believing. I, I, you know, again, in, again in context, there was never, ever, in all the accusations they brought against Jesus, it was never an accusation ever of being a fake healer. Okay. Verse three. He said to the man who had his hand withered, "Stand up." Again, Jesus is speaking with authority here. Well, you see, Jesus is a rabbi. He's a rabbi. Okay, he wasn't just some old hippie guy coming in off the street going to the synagogue. He was a, a rabbi. That's why he. I mean, they didn't make any. They didn't pick any bones with him when it comes to him. You know, just calling some guy to stand up in the middle of the synagogue. 
as a rabbi, as someone in authority, that's what he is, that he, that's what he does. Verse 4. He said to them, okay, so he said to he's speaking to his accusers, he's speaking to his enemies. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill. Okay? So he gives them a choice, basically. Is it lawful to save life or to kill life? Is it life is it lawful to do good or to do harm? Now, I, I've I've heard an, uh, a modern Jewish rabbi say that in the oral law in those days, it is in oral law, in oral Jewish law, that it, it, it is permissible to do good on the Sabbath day. Even today, most of the you know, rabbis that you talk to, if you ask them, is it permissible for me to do something good on the Sabbath day? You know, to save someone whose life I can save? Is it lawful to pull someone out of the water who's drowning on the Sabbath day? You know, I would think I'm, everyone, if not most of the rabbis today, would say, yes, of course it's lawful. So it is lawful. Okay, in context as well. Okay, you got to look at it this way. They're not, they're not they're not talking just about Jewish law. They're they're basing it on the law of God, the Torah of God. So they're saying, is it, and is it permissible according to the law of God to do good on the Sabbath? And according to oral law, yes, it is. So verse four at the last. Part of verse 4 said, but they were silent. Why were they silent? Because they knew it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus never broke the Sabbath. Yeshua never broke the Sabbath. All he did was he came to bring things into perspective. And also, he everything he taught was Torah. Everything he taught was Torah. As a rabbi, that's what he does. And more than a rabbi, he is the word of God, the Torah. Verse 5, when he had looked around them, when he had looked around at them with anger, okay, Jesus wasn't timid here at all. He wasn't timid here at all. He looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardening of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. Ooh, that's a work on the Sabbath day. That, that just goes to remind, you know, some of these critical people, some of these Pharisees, some of these religious people in the New Testament that we read here, especially in the Gospels, are pretty much like a lot of people today uh, in regards, especially in evangelical Christianity. Because in evangelical Christianity, is like, you do salvation without works, all right? Salvation is by faith alone, by, by the grace through faith, by grace through faith, okay? Nothing you do, it's got nothing to do with any, any man's work at all so that no one gets any glory, okay? But once again, they take that right out of context, and they don't even think about what they're talking about. Okay, because it's like, you know, some of these people are like so like, you know, it's got nothing to do with any work of any human being. It's all God's grace through your faith. Nothing that you do. Nothing that any man does, that any flesh does. So that no flesh should glory. Yet, you're, they are the same ones that teach you should go preach the gospel so that other people hear the gospel. Well, first of all, they got to come to the meeting. They got to click on the link or they got to tap or they got to visit the website or whatever. They got to watch the video. They got to listen to the message. There is work involved. Yes, 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 there is work. Okay? Don't tell me there's no work. In, in, in these people, it's by... You know, by grace through faith, period. Absolutely no exceptions, nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. <sighs> These people just don't even think what they're talking about. And they don't know what they're talking about. They don't even know that. They say, it's not by the law of God. It's not by the Torah that we're saved. It's by 
faith. It's by grace through faith. And they don't even know that when Paul preached, when Paul taught about grace through faith, he was actually preaching from, especially like in, um, I believe it was Romans chapter 10, he was really, in other scriptures as well, he was preaching faith, grace, salvation by the Torah. He was referencing the Torah. Okay? But these people don't even know that. He's because you know they they enter into the church and they get educated by Gentile people with a Gentile perspective from Gentile countries with a Gentile mind with Gentile cultures, and they try to they 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 get educated so called educated into a book that was written only by Jews in a Jewish culture in a Jewish land. Speaking of the king of the Jews. Yeah. So you better get educated. Um, that was just a little nugget there I threw in there. It reminds me of uh, Christians today. Oh, we're saved by, by, by grace through faith. Not by works at all. Not by any work at all. Oh, yeah, it takes a lot of work. It takes works. How do you get saved? Well, you got to... You got to listen to a message being preached. Well, or you got to read a book. You got to read the Bible. Well, do you think the Bible just came into existence without any work? Do you think that message was preached without any man's work? I can just hear some of you going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, no. Uh, it's either, it's either yes or no, right? Um, you got to go to the meeting. That's work. You got to sit and listen, understand. Actually, that's work. I mean, speak to people who study hard in university. To actually listen to lectures and, and to understand them, it takes work. It takes brain power. It takes energy. It does. It takes human effort. You can't just sit there in your sleep and, 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 and get a university education. No. It takes work. Okay, so... Um, it's just like these people. No work on the Sabbath. Well, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is according to the Torah. You, you can, and it is permissible. And it's actually even advised or recommended to do good in certain circumstances on the Sabbath. To, yes, do mm -hmm. work. Good works. When he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardening of their hearts. How were they hardened? How were they hardened in their hearts? They were hardened because they did not care about this man. They cared more about, about lording over people according to their understanding or their implementation of the Sabbath rules. They, ca they cared more about their policy or their rules, the rules of men, as opposed to the rules of God, they cared more about that than they cared about this poor man who was suffering with uh, you know, a disability. So Jesus said, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored as healthy as the other. Yeah. Go, go, Jesus, right? Uh, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him that how they might destroy him. See, these people, they got to, comp what kind of, what do they have in their heart? There's, again, there's so many people in this world today that are the same way. They hate people just because they're righteous. They hate people just because they preach against the sin that they love. They hate people, you know, just because... They hate people just because they're better than them. Let's, let's just be honest here. They hated Jesus so much. In spite of all of the good works he did, in spite of the good works that he did, in healing, in, in miracles, by compassion, they hated him. Same way today. You go out there and you preach like Jesus preached. You preach hard against hypocrisy. You preach hard against sin. You preach repentance strong like Jesus preached. That's the context of the whole thing. 
You preach like that. And really, it doesn't matter how good of a man you are. People are going to hate you. Verse 7, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude followed him from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and from Jordan, and those around Tyre and Sidon. A great multitude, hearing what great things he did, came to him. He spoke to his disciples that a little boat should stay near him because of the crowd, so that they wouldn't press on him. Uh, Sounds, sounds kind of, uh, yeah, he has to uh, do a lot of things there to, uh, to keep the, cr- the, the crowds away. Verse 10, verse 10, For he had healed many, so that as many as had diseases pressed on him that they might touch him. The unclean spirits, these are devils, Demons, unclean spirits, entities that has their own mind, their own intellect. Okay, it's, a, it's important to understand what a spirit is. It's not just a feeling or an ambition or an emotion. No, it's, it is an, an actual entity. Unclean spirits, wherever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, You're the Son of God. Verse 12, and again, he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Again, c- contrast this with a lot of the preachers today. They want to go out and, and, and advertise their church. They want to go out and they want to tell everybody what God, how much the great mighty works that God is, is doing in their meetings. That's opposite to what Jesus did here. Verse 13. He went up into the mountain and called to himself those whom he wanted, and they went to him. He appointed twelve. Okay, very interesting. Uh, He could have chosen a million. He could have chosen a thousand. He could have chosen a hundred, but he chose twelve. I wonder, you know, you you see later on in in other other scriptures as well that Jesus said to the twelve, you, I appoint you. I'm giving you the responsibility to sit on 12 judgment seats and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So one apostle for each tribe. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now, the question is, what did they preach? Well, we're we're going to get to that. Verse 15, "And, and to have authority to heal sicknesses and to, cast, and, and to cast out demons as e- unclean spirits, okay? So look at this. Look at, the, look at the, the order here. Number one, to preach, okay? And in that context of the message that they had, which we're, which we're going to get to, they heal sicknesses and cast out evil spirits. Like today, a lot of evil spirits are manifested in tormenting or it was, a lot of people would say attacking them in certain ways. Are you tormented? Do you have depression? It could be an evil spirit. Okay, so verse 16. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, or in the Hebrew, Kepha. James, which his actual original name was Jacob, or actually more accurately pronounced, Jacob, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of Jacob, whom he called Boanerges, which means son of sons of thunder. He called them sons of thunder. That's quite the nickname to get from Jesus. Uh, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, another James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. When he came into a house. And then he came into a house. Verse 20. The multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. When his friends heard it, they went out to seize him for they said, he is insane. You know, you preach like Jesus, you do things like Jesus. What would Jesus do? If you do what Jesus would do, they might call you what they call Jesus. 
as Jesus said himself, the servant is not greater than the master. The student, when the student is fully taught by the teacher, it can be no greater than the teacher. Therefore, if they call the teacher insane, they probably call you insane. They called him insane. He's crazy. He's insane. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul. Beelzebul is Baal Zebul, which is the prince of the flies. Or, excuse me, the Lord of the flies. And by the prince of the demons, he cast out the demons. Verse 23, he summoned them and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? Why would Satan fight, him, fight against himself? If a kingdom is, is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand but has an end. But no one can enter into the house of a strong man to plunder unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Most certainly, I tell you, all sins of the descendants of man will be, will be forgiven, including their blasphemies with which they may blaspheme. But whoever blas may blaspheme against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. The uh, NU manuscripts read, guilty of an eternal sin. I guarantee you, you're not going to get into heaven when you're guilty of an eternal sin. Because they said he, they, uh, he had an unclean spirit. So Jesus made it very clear. You be very careful not to call the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. Because if you do, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you will never be forgiven. No hope. No hope. And I've heard wishy-washy, pathetic preaching pre pastors that like to say, well, if you, if you still come to church, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's drawing you here. Uh, no. What makes you think that your church is, you know, the hub of the Holy Spirit for one thing? I mean, Satan, you can say, Satan goes to church. The evil, the evil spirits go to church too. Well, but if you say the sinner's prayer, but if you're worried about it, this is a big one. This is a big one. If you're worried about it, you haven't committed the sin because you have the Holy Spirit there, and that worry is actually can, is really the actual, actual Holy Spirit that's keeping you from that sin. Uh, no. Look at Judas after he betrayed Jesus. Je Jesus called him a devil. Okay, Jesus said that Judas was a devil. And he actually said it's better that he had not even been born. Yet, after he committed his sin, which, you know, you can say, was that an eternal sin? Was that a, was that a sin that has no, will never be forgiven? After he committed that sin, he was, he felt guilty. He went and threw the money back in the temple. He went and he felt so bad, so bad about it, he hung himself. Okay? So just because you feel bad doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's with you. It doesn't mean that, really. Seriously. So the moral of the story is this. You know, uh, just be careful not to speak evil against the work of the Spirit, okay? If you've done so, there's nothing you can do. I mean, the best thing you can do is just warn other people not to just, you know, spend the rest of your life warning other people not to do the same, okay? So, um, you know, Jesus didn't wash it down. He didn't water it down. He didn't dilute the message. He didn't say, well, yeah, but if you feel sorry, then yes, you have the Holy Spirit. No, 
He, he didn't, he just said it this way. He said it point blank, blank. He, you know, they call it shooting from the hip. He said it hard and strong and he left it as that. Verse 31, his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. A great multitude was sitting around him and they told him, Behold, look, look, look at your, 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 your mother, your brothers, your sisters are outside looking for you. And he answered, Who are my mother and my brothers? You might think, oh, my, brother, my, mother, my mother's here? Oh, I better go see. No, he didn't. He didn't. See, he, he wasn't like that. Strong, a strong man that he was, he says, who's my mother? And it says, verse 34, looking around at those who sat around him, he said, look, look, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does, does. Highlight that word, does. The will of God is my brother, my sister, and mother. That is the end of Mark chapter 3. So once again, thanks again for watching and may God bless you uh, with the reading of this word here, uh, with the reading of his gospel. Um, And may God enlighten the eyes of your understanding to understand it in greater ways than you've ever seen before. And hey, you know, you got something to add? You got some good good points or whatever to add, put them in the comments, okay? And don't forget to subscribe. So thanks again for watching and God bless you.